how to conclude the game, it was declared or decided to award the title of co-champions to both teams in recognition of the hard work and determination showed by all participants on both sides, not to mention the officials who put in seven, seven extra periods. Mr. Speaker, I would like to formally congratulate both teams for their contribution to the Nova Scotian hockey lore and their shared accomplishment, and both coaches for coming up with a creative co-champion solution that stays true to the spirit of minor hockey while acknowledging the hard work and success of all involved. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank everybody for those very thoughtful and warm member statements as we get ready for question period, oral questions put by members to ministers. And uh, we'll take a second to wish the leader of the official opposition a happy 50th birthday on the record. We'll now move on to oral questions put by members to ministers. The leader of the official opposition. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, for sharing that with all the people that are here today. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. Nova Scotians uh, were surprised to learn last week that the government is cutting more than $500,000 from a very important public safety program called Boots on the Street. They're perplexed because this comes at a time when really residents all over the province are worried about safety here in their capital city, Mr. Speaker. So I'd like to ask the Premier, why is his government cutting this important safety program, Boots on the Street, at a time when we need to deal with violent crime in the capital of Halifax? The Honourable Premier. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the Honourable Member for the question. I want to thank all those men and women in uniform who are working across our province to keep our community safe. Mr. Speaker, our government has continued to invest uh, over six million dollars in that program. We could sixteen, sorry, Mr. Speaker. We continue to work with law enforcement agencies across the province. That program is having review. That in no way means that it's disappearing. Uh, uh, that is something that, that would be normal for government to assess programs, uh, the ways that we can make them different, or the ways that we can enhance them. Perhaps, Mr. Speaker, uh, we need to have more. Uh, but I can tell you one of the things that uh, has been very clear not only in this province but across the country. You want to deal with crime, you've got to deal with the root causes of crime, Mr. Speaker. Dealing with poverty is why we've invested a low-income Nova Scotia. Mr. Speaker, let's go chart, making, making sure people have affordable housing, Mr. Speaker, is why we're going to continue to work with the Minister of Community Services to provide options for low-income Nova Scotia when it comes to a safe environment. And we're going to continue, Mr. Speaker, to attack root causes of crime in the way as we keep our streets safe. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Mr. Speaker, cutting the number of sworn officers on our streets is not attacking the root causes of crime. We'd be the first ones to say great if that was happening. And here we go again, Mr. Speaker. They cut first, and they're going to review that afterwards, Mr. Speaker. We saw that with the film industry. We saw it with Pharmacare. Now the officers on our streets, the men and women that keep us safe, they have a cut, and they'll review later. Mr. Speaker, can the Premier explain to the House how it makes sense to cut such an important safety program and then review it after the cut has happened? The Honourable Premier. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the Honourable Member for the question. Uh, Mr. Speaker, it's my understanding there's been no loss of employment uh, when it comes to law enforcement officers across this province. We continue to work with our partners. They continue to work with community organizations to keep our streets safe. They're continuing to reach out, Mr. Speaker, to work with community organizations, government departments across the entire government to ensure we attack the root causes of crime, Mr. Speaker. We're going to continue to make sure that we keep our streets safe. But, Mr. Speaker, we're also going to do the right thing and continue to make sure we invest in Nova Scotians so that they can have, Mr. Speaker, the skills required to continue to provide themselves with the same optimistic future that every Nova Scotian should deserve to have. To go forward to. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Mr. Speaker, the fact of the matter is this program supports very important public safety initiatives, including mental health training for police officers, something that is urgently needed on the streets, not just in Halifax, but across the province. It supports criminal investigations. It supports ident and communications between police forces. Mr. Speaker, the Premier is cutting it. Here in Halifax, people are very worried about the recent reports of horrible crimes, Mr. Speaker. Can the Premier tell us for sure how many officers are going to be taken off the streets in Halifax because of his cuts to boots on the street? The Honourable Premier. Mr. Speaker, we spent $16.2 million on this program. Mr. Speaker, we're going to continue to invest uh, in law enforcement across this province. But, Mr. Speaker, we cannot continue to be short-sighted, Mr. Speaker, when it comes to dealing with crime in this province. We need to be aggressively attacking the root causes of crime. This government, our government, is going to continue to work with not profit organizations across this province with law enforcement agencies to make sure, Mr. Speaker, that we deal with the root causes of what we're seeing on our streets across this province. 
so we can get a long-term, sustainable solution, Mr. Speaker, to give every Nova Scotian an opportunity at a positive, optimistic future. The Honourable Leader in the House for the New Democratic Party. Mr. Speaker, I note that the Premier has stated on a, a few occasions just that he is attempting to address the root, co root causes of crime, but I note that affordable housing does not appear to be on the Premier's radar. For the past two years, the Premier has considerably underspent on the province's housing strategy. Two years ago, they underspent $2.4 million, and last year it was underspent by $1.1 million. So over two years, this totals 3.5, not spent on the housing strategy. Can the Minister, can the Premier justify underspending on our province's housing strategy? The Honourable Premier Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the Honourable Member for the question. She raises a very serious issue, one that, Mr. Speaker, our government takes seriously. That's why, very early on in our mandate, we invested heavily in rent rent supplements so that low-income Nova Scotians, Mr. Speaker, find at the same time, Mr. Speaker, we're reducing the wait list for those looking for affordable housing in this province. We're going to continue to work with our partners across this province, Mr. Speaker, so that we can find long-term sustainable solutions to the challenges facing Nova Scotia families. The Honourable Leader in the House for the New Democratic Party. Mr. Speaker, this is absolutely unbelievable. Not only has our Premier decided not to spend millions on the housing strategy, but he's underspent in the area of social housing subsidies. Last year, the Premier did not spend a total of 3.5 million dollars on social housing subsidies, despite a waiting list of close to 5,000 people, and I will table that. These subsidies are given to our province's most vulnerable, so they don't have to choose be between food and shelter. My question to the Premier, given that our, our public housing wait list is close to 5,000 people, what possible excuse does the Premier have to justify underspending on social housing subsidies by $3.5 million? The Honourable Premier. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the Honourable Member for the question. Uh, we continue to work with our partners across this province to deal with the issue of affordable housing. We've continued to invest in affordable housing, whether it's in rent subsidies, Mr. Speaker, working with our housing authority across all across our province to deal with the challenges they face. Uh, at the same time, Mr. Speaker, we're seeing the wait list go down. Yet, Mr. Speaker, when I listen to the member opposite, she has not meant a problem that throwing money at she doesn't believe will solve. We're going to find a long-term solution working with our partners, Mr. Speaker, in a sustainable way so that every low-income Nova Scotia can find themselves in a safe, secure place to live, Mr. Speaker. We're going to do that so that we can be sustainable in the long run. The Honourable Leader in the House for the New Democratic Party. Mr. Speaker, it's hard to believe, but there is yet another area in the affordable housing that the Premier has decided not to spend all the money he allocated for last year. The Premier underspent in the area of housing renovation and affordable housing by $1.5 million, and I will table that. These funds are used to keep seniors and persons with disabilities safe and comfortable in their homes. In total, Mr. Speaker, last year the Premier decided not to spend over $6 million on affordable housing despite thousands of Nova Scotians' need. I ask the Premier, can he explain any of this to those who are in desperate need of affordable housing? The Honourable Premier. Speaker, again, I want to thank the Honourable Member for the question. I want to again thank our partners across this province who have been working with uh, Mr. Speaker, landlords who have been uh, working with us, uh, with uh, community members across this province, taking advantage of the rent supplement opportunities that are there. Uh, we're continuing to make sure that the wait list goes down, Mr. Speaker. We're working uh, with our housing authorities from one end of the province to the other to ensure that we have uh, affordable housing in communities uh, across Nova Scotia. We're going to continue to do uh, the work, Mr. Speaker, that I believe is the responsibility of government is looking after the most vulnerable citizens in our province. Uh, but, Mr. Speaker, I don't I, I want to tell the Honourable Member, it's only been two and a half years. It's very difficult to make up for four years of damage in two and a half years. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Business. Yesterday, Mr. Speaker, I asked that Minister about the Credit Union Small Business Loan Guarantee Program since his department, or he, issued a release that listed all the benefits of this program, including that it has helped 2,000 small businesses across the province create jobs, uh, but yet they're reviewing the program anyway, Mr. Speaker, despite its obvious success. The Minister defended that action of review, saying that it would only be prudent to use taxpayers' money to review a program, whether it was successful or not. 
Mr. Speaker, it turns out that his department spent over $100,000 to hire Deloitte to do just such a review in 2015. So I'd like to ask the Minister, can he confirm that his department already did a review at a cost of $100,000 of the credit union program by Deloitte last year? The Honourable Minister of Business. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yes, I can confirm that the Department uh, uh, expended money to do a review on the delivery of the program. Uh, the review we're talking about, Mr. Speaker, is a review, a review of the finances of the, uh, of the program, and we believe uh, Nova Scotia taxpayers would expect that to be due diligence and appropriate work on the part of government. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Mr. Speaker, in this House yesterday, the Minister of Business said, and I quote directly from Hansard, it's what government should be doing when we're expending taxpayers' dollars. Thirteen years without a review. It's appropriate. Now it turns out there was a review done just a year ago, Mr. Speaker. No wonder the government saw the success of the program. They doubled its funding, Mr. Speaker, at the time, something we supported. We assumed correctly even though the minister didn't disclose it yesterday, that they had done a review. Now, less than a year later, they're going to do a second review. Mr. Speaker, how is doing two reviews at a cost of at least $100,000 of a program that we all supposedly agree is a good one, a good use of taxpayers' dollars? The Honourable Minister of Business. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, my learned colleague is, uh, is the accountant. He would know the difference between a review of the delivery of the program and a review of the finances of the program. The Honourable House Leader for the New Democratic Party. Mr. Speaker, the Nova Scotia... Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, the Nova Scotia mental health strategy and addiction strategy is approaching the end of five-year uh, plan. The strategy was started uh, under the previous NDP government and has been praised uh, by the current minister and, and the government on a number of occasions. Uh, despite this praise, Mr. Speaker, we've heard very little from the minister on what the next steps are for the mental health and addiction strategy. In a media, recent media scrum, the minister stated that he's planning on conducting some type of review, uh, but provided no real details, Mr. Speaker. So I'd like to ask the minister, uh, what is the minister's plan for the review of the mental health and addiction strategy? The Honourable Minister of Health. Uh, thank, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I'm pleased to say that uh, the department uh, is now underway. Uh, with looking at the uh, 33 recommendations uh, uh, as to the extent that they uh, have been implemented and also uh, what kind of outcomes and impacts uh, that they have been able to, uh, to make. And, uh, and so over the next uh, number of months, uh, we'll have uh, both department and uh, also the NSHA uh, providing feedback uh, on the current strategy. The Honourable House Leader for the New Democratic Party. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, but what I didn't hear is a more wide consultation, which is needed. The creation of the province's first mental health and addiction strategy did just that. There needs to be consultation with an advisory, mental health advisory committee, or even broader within the, uh, within the province, Mr. Speaker. Our concern is that there may be a gap. Uh, we know that this takes some time to uh, implement and gather a new strategy. Uh, so can the minister ensure us today that there will be no gaps between the current mental health and addiction strategy and whatever the government decides to bring forward in the future? The Honourable Minister of Health. Uh, thank you, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank the member opposite the former health minister for a very important uh, uh, point that he's made here today that there should be uh, uh, no delay, no gaps uh, whatsoever uh, in pointing to, uh, uh, yes, the wonderful benefits that uh, have been created through the strategy, but more importantly, uh, where do we go for the next uh, five years? Uh, and I uh, want to assure uh, the member and all Nova Scotians that uh, we'll, we will have an announcement uh, within the next few weeks about uh, how the uh, review will be conducted uh, and also how we lay out the plans for the next five years. The Honourable Member for Inverness. Mr. Speaker, when are we going to have an election? Unfortunately, the only person that can answer that question is the Premier. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, the power is in his hands because only he can call it. Now, that runs counter to the recommendation from Elections Nova Scotia and even runs counter to Bill 74 that the Premier introduced back in 2007 right here in this legislature. Mr. Speaker, maybe we could introduce that legislation again word for word. 
with the premier, with the premier, and the member from Richmond is talking about another bill that uh, was actually introduced by us first in 2011. But that's another story, Mr. Speaker. Would the premier support a bill written word for word like his 2007 bill to introduce fixed election dates? The honourable premier. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the honourable member. I'll do better than that. I'll take advice from him. If he wants to pick a date, I'll be more than happy to entertain it. <laughs> The Honourable Member for Inverness. That's a lot. Of, that's a lot of power to give me, Mr. Speaker. I, I would, I would settle for for the fall. <laughs> we can have it any fall, Mr. Speaker. I'm ready any time. So, Mr. Speaker, and I don't see how anybody could uh, could go against this because we know that uh, members in the House, particularly on the government side, even campaign for fixed election dates. Mr. Speaker, Nova Scotia's Chief Electoral Officer, Richard Temporal, has said that the province could save up to half a million dollars in, in administrative costs if we had fixed election dates. Why the change of heart, Mr. Speaker? Does the Premier feel he has an advantage? He does not want to give up, even if it costs the taxpayers in the province a half a million dollars? The Honourable Premier. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the Honourable Member for the question. The only people who've raised fixed election dates, Mr. Speaker, has been the Conservative Party of Nova Scotia. As we go across the province, Mr. Speaker, Nova Scotia continue to remind us they want to work with us to drive economic growth. Small business confidence, the highest in the country, Mr. Speaker. Youth employment up, Mr. Speaker. Population growing. Today we announced an Asia strategy, Mr. Speaker, doubling exports into Asia last year. Mr. Speaker, all I hear from Nova Scotia is continue to work with us so we can move this province forward. Forward. And forget about the pessimistic pieces coming across on the other side of the house. The Honourable Member for Pictou West. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question through you is to the Minister of Health. Yesterday, Pictou County residents learned that the outpatient clinic at the Sutherland Harris Memorial Hospital will abruptly close tomorrow. This most unacceptable situation places greater burden on the ER at the Aberdeen Hospital in New Glasgow. My question is simple. How did this happen? The Honourable Minister of Health. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, and there is a reality that we all face uh, in Nova Scotia, and that is, uh, you know, doctors uh, are private uh, business people. Uh, this was a uh, this was a private uh, clinic at the Sutherland Hospital. Uh, what uh, the people of Picto know is that just a very short uh, ways away is a very very strong collaborative practice that is handling the needs of patients in that area. The Honourable Member for Pictou West. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, that answer is unacceptable because I'll tell you right now, there's too many people in Pictou West that can't afford the $50 tra transportation that it costs to get there. You know, this was a clinic that definitely served 20 people or more in the evenings, and people are struggling. I would like the minister to stand in his place and commit to the good people of Pictou West that he will help find locums to serve this outpatient clinic until we find a longer-term solution for this problem. We need doctors. The Honourable Mem Minister of Health. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I'm pleased to say, first of all, in a general uh, statement, that 90% uh, of Nova Scotians uh, have a family uh, physician, uh, and we know we we know Order, please. we know that the Honourable Minister of Health has the floor. In fact, we know that this is one of the highest uh, in the country. Uh, there are, from time to time, uh, areas that uh, maybe without a family doctor, uh, this area has an outstanding uh, collaborative practice. Uh, the the emergency department at Aberdeen serves the population very, very well. It is, uh, it is being refurbished and able to, in fact, increase capacity. Uh, that's the strengths that are taking place uh, in that area of the province. The Honourable Member for Pictou East. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Minister of Health can stand here every day and say things are better in health care for Nova Scotians, and his colleagues can clap. The fact of the matter is, they're not. And this year, the government has said that it will, help, it will hold the health care budget to a 1% increase, and people have been wondering how. It goes up 2% a year just on inflation. How will they hold it at 1%? Well, folks, we're starting to see how. We'll close mental health units. We'll close, we'll close walk-in clinics. We'll have less doctors. People need doctors. People need access to health care. My question for the Minister is, are these closures and increased waiting lists, are they a symptom of the Liberal health care plan? 
The Honorable Minister of Health. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And it gives me an opportunity uh, to say how the health care system across uh, Nova Scotia, all the clinicians and teams, in fact, are working just a little bit differently. I want to just, just to point out a couple of examples. Uh, uh, with roughly the same amount of money, we've done 500 to 600 additional uh, hips and knees. And we all know that at the Aberdeen, we have one of the strongest orthopedic teams in the province. And uh, we also have had a 12% reduction in wait times for MRIs. We're doing things differently and with better results. The Honourable Member for Picto East. Well, things are certainly be di being done differently. The wait lists are getting longer. Doctors are working longer. They're working harder. They're working more hours. They're exhausted. They're burning out. So my question is, my question, the Premier says he thought we didn't have any. He's absolutely right. We, sir, do not have enough doctors. We need more. My question for the Minister is, what's the plan to attract and retain doctors? That's what people want to know. You're failing the province. What are you going to do to change it? The Honourable Minister of Health. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, we, all, we all know that any of us can rise here, uh, like the member opposite, and have some rhetoric. Uh, we have, we have, we have, we have, we have in this prop. Order, please. The Honourable Minister of Health. We, in fact, we are, we are fortunate in this province to have the most doctors per capita of any province in Canada. And that's just... And that Order, is a, please. And that Order, please. Order, please. We can, we can close question period, period, and move on to the next item of business here. We'll let the Honourable Minister of Health answer the question, please. The Honourable Minister of Health. Uh, thank, you, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I know that so far in 2016, we've had very, very strong uh, recruitment. Uh, since February, about 48 additional doctors uh, in the central zone. Uh, we have uh, we have uh, we have six under contract with uh, more committed to uh, Cape Breton this year. One, uh, we had we had great dif we had some difficulties recruiting for Bedak. Two new doctors have started in Bedak. For the first time, for the first time in years, we've recruited a doctor to Shelburne. So so the reality, the reality, order, Mr. Please. Speaker, is order, please. <laughs> order, please. The honourable member for Dartmouth East. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm thinking. Of I'm thinking everybody forgot their yoga last night, but um, my question is for the Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure Renewal. Uh, Mr. Speaker, we learned from um, reports that a tender issued by his Department for Disposal of Biomedical Waste has been changed to eliminate the requirement for a facility to be operated in Nova Scotia. I'm wondering why was the tender changed to eliminate the requirement to invest in Nova Scotia, and was it changed at the request of a Nova Scotia company or an out-of-province company? The Honourable Minister of Transportation. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, to the member's question, I have no idea anything about that tender. I've never seen anything about it. I, I know nothing of that issue, so I can uh, do some research and get back to the member on that. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth East. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and, and, and that's, that's fair. Uh, I, I look forward to him getting back from me. Maybe at the same uh, token, he can look into the second part of the question. Aside from the fact that it seems to go against the principle that this government has had over the past couple of years, when waste is to be treated in the province in which it has originated, and obviously legislation was introduced in that respect around fracking waste. Um, more important than that principle is the fact that the tender is now worded that there is no longer a requirement that Nova Scotia taxpayer dollars have the effect of creating investment and employment in Nova Scotia. And so I'm interested to know why that change was allowed. I know he's going to have to look into it based on his other his previous the Honourable response. Honourable Minister of Transportation. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And again, to the member's question, I, I don't have any uh, background whatsoever on that. I can check in uh, to that. Obviously, there's procurement rules based on how we do a number of these things under transportation, but uh, I will endeavor to get uh, that information on that specific question and get back to the House. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Pictou East. Oh, pardon me, my mistake. The Honourable Member for Truro, Bible Hill, Millbrook, Salmon River. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This week, the Auditor General provided a progress report on recommendations from a 2012 performance audit. Among other things, the audit concluded that education rights of children enrolled in the provincial homeschooling program need to be protected by the Department of Education. And at that time, the response from the department was that they would take action and develop a strategy in response to the report and to his concerns. However, now the department says they have no intention of impl implementing these recommendations. So my question to the Minister of Education and Early Childhood Development, could she please explain why she has decided to ignore the advice of the Auditor General? The Honourable Minister of Education. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And to speak to the uh, issue uh, of, of the question, the Auditor General did bring down a report in 2012. Perhaps in haste, the Minister of the Day and the Deputy of the Day said yes, as somebody said, they nodded and said yes, failing to look at what the Education Act said about the rights of parents for homeschooling. The Honourable Member for Truro, Bible Hill, Millbrook, Salmon River. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you for that answer. Mr. Speaker, parents who homeschool are deeply committed to their children's education. However, in school classrooms, there are ongoing assessments to make sure that children are learning the skills that they need to succeed in post-secondary education and in the workforce. So could the minister please explain why her department is refusing to take steps to make sure that homeschooled children are actually making the same type of educational progress? The Honourable Minister of Education. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And uh, as the member uh, may not know, that when parents have the right to uh, enroll their children in a homeschooling program, they also have the right to choose the curriculum and the program that they follow. And so there are over a thousand kids uh, in homeschooling. That means could mean over a thousand different programs. That's the decision and the right of the parent, and we respect it. The Honourable Member for Pictou East. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We heard, we heard th this afternoon that there's lots of doctors in Nova Scotia, plenty of doctors in Nova Scotia. We also heard that the people who had their clinic closed should just go down the road to where, there's, where there are doctors that are open. And, I'm gonna, and then we said, no more rhetoric. So I'm going to ask a straight-up question for the Minister. What's the Minister doing to make sure that this clinic stays open? Is he doing anything, or is he happy to see it close? The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. First of all, it's important to uh, point out that this was a, uh, a private, uh, you know, uh, clinic uh, set up, yes, to meet needs of, uh, of patients in the after hours. Uh, uh, these doctors now have decided, for whatever reason, uh, they will no longer uh, hold a the clinic. They move from seven days uh, to four days. Uh, they have a, they're all work in a collaborative practice. Uh, the Nova Scotia Health Authority uh, is taking a look at what the needs uh, are, are required in that area. Uh, Dr. Lowe has been on to this uh, issue now uh, for the past couple of weeks, and I think we'll see uh, you know uh, results from that that are appropriate for the area. It is, it is important to point out that in fact in New Glasgow, uh, we have one of the best models of collaborative practice. It's been copied by many from across the province. We have a collaborative practice as well in Picto and is serving the needs of the, that population. The Honourable Member for Picto East. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and the people of the area will take little comfort in the Minister's words. The last time the Minister came to Picto County, he was closing the mental health unit for three months. Three months while they sorted out the staffing issues. Well, sir, many, many more months than three months have passed, and now he says, well, it didn't work to begin with. So now we stand here today, we hear him say there's lots of doctors. The health authority clearly would have known, should have known, for months and months that there was doctors being ready to retire, that, there was, there was a, that the, the service being provided was at risk. Did they sit on their hands? Did they do nothing? What is the message? Happy with the closure, Minister? 
The Honourable Minister of Health. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and, uh, and obviously uh, to the first question. Uh, the, member, the member opposite knows very well, he's been well informed about uh, why the mental health clinic, which was, which was not a short-term psychiatric unit meeting the standards of this province and across the country, and he'll see over the, the next number of months that, that mental health uh, support in that area, uh, and we've, al we've always moved patients across the province uh, to get the appropriate care. In terms of uh, primary care, uh, building collaborative practices and the capacity uh, in those areas is what the uh, health authority is well underway with, and we'll see those kind of results. The Honourable Member for Northside, Westmount. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Minister Responsible Part 2 of the Gaming Act. Yesterday, I asked the Minister Responsible for the Gaming whether he plans to cap Chase the Ace jackpots. On both occasions, the Minister refused to rule out capping Chase the Ace jackpots. In the media scrum after question period, the Premier said that, to his knowledge, there was no plan to cap the jackpots. Nova Scotians have seen this before, Mr. Speaker, and... and and this Premier has said stay tough before and said he doesn't deal directly with his department. So my question to the Minister, since yesterday, has the Minister updated the Premier on discussions of whether he will be capping Chase Yates lottery jackpots or not? The Honourable Minister responsible for Part 2 of the Gaming Act. Th th thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, what I was explaining to my colleague yesterday is the work that has gone on between uh, those who are running the... Uh, the lottery, the, the Chase the Ace at the Ashby Legion in Sydney, and those in the department. I spoke about circumstances in the Inverness uh, Chase the Ace, Mr. Speaker. What I've said is there's ongoing work to ensure the sustainability of the game and the integrity of the great game, as well as public safety. And we see that by the work that many volunteers are doing and the engagement of security personnel and police. What I will tell my colleague, as the Premier has said, there's no cap being considered for Chase the Ace. The Honourable Member for Northside Westmount. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I appreciate that answer. And I know the people who are organizing Chase the Ace lotteries all over the province will appreciate that answer as well. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Pictou West. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question through you is to the Minister of TIR. I have a large number of gravel dirt roads in Pictou West. My office receives numerous calls from people who can't go outside, hang their clothes out, or even open their windows due to large amounts of dust that arise from the traffic. In fact, I receive more calls about dust control than I do about snow removal. And given the relatively modest winter with snow plowing, the Department of TIR must have seen some decrease in costs. Therefore, does the Minister have a plan to use any of the excess funds to purchase more than usual magnesium chloride for dust control. The Honourable Minister of Transportation. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank the member opposite for the question. Uh, we're, we're still looking at uh, some of the, the uh, areas uh, of maintenance for the gravel roads, so as the, the member had been uh, in the estimates and, of course, uh, during QP for the many questions that we've received from all sides of the house with respect to gravel. Uh, there's a number of things we're looking at in the very short term here. We're, we're, we're certainly getting the message uh, that we need to uh, put together some additional maintenance and, and uh, some, some form of uh, support to bolster up the gravel roads as there certainly is a problem. Each and every uh, spring thaw we see issues with gravel roads, but there's really a, a new level of, of concern here for all districts of the province. So we are working on uh, some of the issues. Dust control is one of those, obviously the brush cutting, ditching culverts, but of course the, the, the road surface itself. So it is a concern for us and we're looking uh, very seriously at, at some of the changes we can make in the short term. The Honourable Member for Pictou West. Thank you very much Mr. Speaker and I thank the Minister for his answer. Uh, we all know that we're not paving any more roads in no rural Nova Scotia. There are a lot of dirt roads in this province, and it's not uncommon to witness where there was once pavement, it is now dirt. And the current guidelines for applying dust control to our dirt roads once per year simply is not enough. Rural taxpayers deserve to enjoy their properties like everyone else, and in most cases in the wintertime, they are the last to be plowed out. Will the minister please tell the good people of Pictou West when a plan may be table so they can assure that they can enjoy their properties like anyone else on a paved road. The Honourable Minister of Transportation. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank the member for the question. I, I certainly uh, I do appreciate the, the concerns that come from 
uh, all parts of the province and, and certainly uh, with what she's hearing in Pictou West. Again, uh, it is a decision that's made the operational and the capital side are made at a very local level. Uh, clearly, the, the, the representatives of TIR in her riding and, and in all regions across the province look at uh, each individual case. Uh, clearly, there's, there's factors and elements in the equation such as dust control, uh, such as uh, significant uh, breaks in the paving that have to be addressed immediately. Then, of course, there's a long-term capital plan, and that's why we have to, when we're talking about like, things like gravel road and low volume roads, uh, we look at innovative ways to get some of that attention that they certainly do need. So uh, we are listening loud and clear, and we're working on those solutions, and we'll put that together as soon as we possibly can. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Queen Shelburne. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Natural Resources. In an interview with CBC Radio last March, the former Minister of Natural Resources, a member from Yarmouth, called FSC certification the gold standard for forestry operation, and I can table that. Fast forward, Mr. Speaker, to this year and the announcement by the current minister that this certification will be dropped from a large tract of land in western Nova Scotia because of duplication, and I will table that. My question for the minister is, why does he share a different opinion on forced, forced recertification than the member from Yarmouth? The Honourable Minister of Natural Resources. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Our government is a strong supporter of certification, forest certification, and the internationally recognized sustainable forest in initiative certification remains in place uh, across Nova Scotia. And where the FSC was in place on lands only owned by the province, that doesn't affect private uh, landowners to keep FSC certification, which is being done. And the work that's being done in the Medway lands will steward to the FSC certification. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Queen Shelburne. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, regional services provided by National Resources include conservation programs and forest fire prevention. This year, the regional service budget for each of the central, eastern, and western zones has been cut by $2 million. Can the Minister explain why this budget for regional services in each of these zones have been cut? The Honourable Minister of Natural Resources. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and thank the member opposite for the question. There have been significant uh, changes uh, in responsibility within the department, uh, which has resulted in the transfer of, of uh, personnel to other departments of government, and that is what he is seeing in the reduction. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The Honourable Member for Pictou Centre. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is, is for the uh, Minister of uh, Community Services. Uh, Mr. Uh, Speaker, during the past uh, many months, a number of visitors to my office expressed frustration with the following issue. They were all students attending Nova Scotia Community College, Pictou Campus, and Stellarton. Neither their EI ran out or they were short in funds to complete their studies. We find ourselves reaching out to Salvation Army church groups, trying to help them with the funding in order to complete their studies. A visit to the Department of Community Services seeking some measure of financial support and the answer is no. My question to the Minister, is there any program available to assist these students so they are able to complete their program? The Honourable Minister of Community Services. Thank you, and I thank the member for uh, his question. Unfortunately, unless you are a client of the Department of Community Services and have worked through an employment services uh, case plan with your caseworker, um, you have to be on income assistance for six months in order to go through the post-secondary slate of programs that we have. We do have excellent uh, student services and student assistant programs in Nova Scotia, uh, but there is nothing that is available for students um, uh, who, who want to come to community services as a last resort. The Honourable Member for Pictou Centre. Uh, thank you, Mr. Uh, Speaker. The most recent visitor, a 32-year-old single mother of a four-year-old daughter, will graduate after she completes her five-week work experience program. Her EI benefits have expired. Department of Community Service told this mother because she was in school, she was not eligible for any funding. However, if they were to return to the Department of Community Service the next day and inform them that she left school and she's not returning, there would be funding available. 
My question to the Minister, why is the Department closing doors to students that want to improve their chances of gaining permanent employment, thereby removing themselves from further or any community service assistance? The Honourable Minister of Community Services. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'd like to thank the member for that question, which quite clearly highlights the need for transformation in the Department of Community Services. Um, the goal of any government department should be to assist people so that they can reach their full potential. I'm happy to report those conversations are very much uh, uh, going on in the department, and that will all be part of the transformation rolled out in the coming months. The Honourable Member for Inverness. The three recent homicides in HRM remind us that violence is used as a tool in a world where money is made on illegal drugs and human sex trafficking. Mr. Speaker, guns were used in these crimes, but they were not the cause. It starts when kids don't see opportunities for prosperity. In some cases, they see drug dealers as people who have status and that can afford to buy nice things. The seeds are planted early and watered with a culture of glorified violence. Can the minister tell us what the government is doing to show these young Nova Scotians that there are other opportunities? The Honourable Minister of Justice. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and, and uh, I certainly ag agree with the member opposite that this is a very somber issue. Uh, very. Um, deep-seated issue that we need to deal with. Um, the question he asks is perhaps not best placed with justice, although I can speak to justice having crime prevention programs and working in communities across the province. Um, there's a program that funds 21 different community groups in, in after-school programs. I visited the one at JL Ilsley, which is, is very much art-based and has funding as well federally from the Michael Jean Foundation. Um, so we have programs. The Department of Education has a lot of special programs programs around hub schools and, and Schools Plus, which are, are not in every school in the province but are widely spread around the province to target those kind of needs. And I mean, really, it's a multidisciplinary, multi-departmental response. The Honourable Member for Inverness. Mr. Speaker, a supplementary for the, for the Minister of Justice, but if she wishes to redirect it, that would be fine by me. Mr. Speaker, families need help and communities need help. They need to be empowered to fix these problems. The kind of violent behavior that we've been seeing does not happen overnight. What makes young people choose a life that brings such misery? What has the minister heard from the families who have recently experienced the violence that we've seen? Have they been asked what has gone wrong? Have they been asked what have, could have stopped this before it started? The Honourable Minister of Justice. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I, just to begin with, I haven't heard directly from the families, but as the members of the House know, we have got a, a program, Victim Services, which is available for all the victims of crime and their families to help them cope and to, to help them when charges are laid, to help them with the court system, and also to provide counseling so that they can have some, some opportunity to, to get help that way as well, because we know it's extremely traumatizing. But Mr. Speaker, the important message for all of us is that there is no easy answer and I think the public should be well aware at, that there is no single thing that we do, not one thing alone and the answer does lie in working with our communities, you know, right around the province, wherever there's a, a, an outbreak of crime or a particular uh, problem in, in the community that's criminal. So we do, are working closely with ceasefire, with stop the violence and six members, I, I think maybe seven members of the legislature were there at the march on Sunday to listen to the public, to stand with them, and to see what, what we can learn and do together. The Honourable House Leader for the New Democratic Party. Mr. Speaker, it's cold comfort to the thousands of Nova Scotians who don't have a family physician to hear the Minister stand in his place and recite the percentage of physicians to uh, pay, uh, residents we have in this province. In the last election, the Premier and the Liberal Party of Nova Scotia promised every Nova Scotian a doctor, Mr. Right. Speaker. That's and if right. they shredded that document, I'll pro provide one for them, Mr. Speaker. The New Nova Scotia Health Authority is limiting and not allowing physicians to open up and practice here in Nova Scotia. When will the Minister of Health step in and instruct the no Nova Scotia Health Authority to remove that policy so that phys physicians can open practices here in Nova Scotia? Here, here. The Honourable Minister of Health. Uh, 
Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, pleased to say that, uh, in fact, as just this morning, uh, we had a meeting at the department with uh, Dr. Harrigan, Dr. Gass, and others to take a look at, uh, uh, you know, a more robust, uh, you know, provincial plan. Uh, we, we've made strides in communities that were looking for months and even years for a family doctor uh, to be able to procure one. And I can assure that the, uh, the member opposite from Shelburne will have an opportunity to personally greet a new doctor this summer. The Honourable House Leader for the New Democratic Party. The Minister is missing the point. Nova Scotia needs a doctor now. And I'll tell the member opposite, they need doctors now in his community and communities all across Nova Scotia, Mr. Speaker. This government promised they would have action. And all they've done is amalgamate the district health authorities. Physicians want to play a role in increasing the number of physicians here. They've created a mess for them to gain access to the licenses that they need to expand their practice. Why? Why is the government blocking the, the ability for physicians and physicians' offices to expand their practices. There's physicians in Bedford, in Beaverbank, that have been denied, Mr. Speaker, and they know there's an issue, and there needs to be more physicians in Nova Scotia. When will the minister step up and become the Minister of Health and instruct the health authority to remove that policy the Honourable in, their, minister of in health. program? What I can tell the member opposite in all Nova Scotians and the residents of uh, the central region here in Capital uh, that we've had a very, very strong uh, recruitment period since February, uh, for, uh, 48, uh, 48 doctors. But one of the areas that has been problematic and not sustainable uh, is clinics going out and doing their own recruitment. We've actually streamlined the process now of being able to uh, get, be able to get doctors uh, into clinics and into do practice uh, here, uh, here in Metro and across and across Nova Scotia, and uh, and I know that uh, we will continue to uh, provide communities uh, with physicians. But more importantly, changing the model of practice is also equally important. The Honourable Member for Sydney River, Myra Lewisburg. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question through you is to the Minister of Health. Yesterday in the House, I asked the Minister of Health about the doctor shortage in Cape Breton Island. A few moments ago, he said we had the highest per capita rate of doctors in the country. Well, I can, I can tell you, Mr. Speaker, they must be all in Halifax, because they certainly aren't around. <laughs> to my point, they're not. Yesterday, I talked... Yes Yesterday... We talked about the orphan clinic, a thousand patients and they couldn't take any more. They had to close their doors. We talked about the fact that there are ten shortages. And the minister's response was, oh, we've got six coming. Residents, they're not going to stay. Mr. Speaker, does the Minister of Health know that Cape Breton Island is a part of the province of Nova Scotia? The Honourable Minister of Health. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I'm reminded by my Cape Breton colleagues every day how important Cape Breton is to the province and the many, and the many contributions uh, they make. Uh, look, uh, we, we know that, uh, for example, the community of Bedeck. I met uh, two of the doctors, uh, one 70-something, the other approaching 80, uh, wanting to retire. Uh, we've provided two doctors uh, to that community, and, and Niels Harbour, Niels Harbour, Niels Harbour crying for a doctor again uh, with Dr. Ken, 70-something years of age, and we will be meeting the needs of Cape Breton and the doctors they require. The Honourable Member for Sydney Rivermeyer and Lewisburg. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, in the platform that the government ran on, they said, a doctor for every Nova Scotian. That's what they promised. A thousand people in a waiting room trying to find service from a doctor. And you believe that that Order, is please. okay? Order, please. I'd like to remind the honorable member not to refer to members opposite directly to direct your questions through the chair. 
The Honorable Member for Sydney River, Myra Lewisburg. Thank you very much for that correction, Mr. Speaker. My mistake. But the very fact is this government believes that it's okay to have an orphan clinic that can't service the needs of the people of the province of Nova Scotia. The minister is fond of saying that this government, that the health care is in transition. Well, the transition is into quicksand, Mr. Speaker. When is this minister going to realize that there is a definite shortage of doctors in Cape Breton Island and we have to do more than say, oh, we've got the highest percentage in Nova Scotia and Canada? The Honourable Minister of Health. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I thank uh, uh, the member for his uh, passionate uh, delivery of that question because it is a central and very important question to the people of Cape Breton and whatever parts of the province where there aren't uh, enough uh, primary uh, care uh, clinicians. Uh, we know that uh, Cape Breton is an area that is now being heavily uh, recruited for, uh, and we know also that uh, you know it takes uh, time to... Uh, Order, to get please. The, the Honourable Minister of Health has the floor. The Honourable Minister uh, of Health. We've increased the number of positions at the uh, Dow med, med School, uh, and we know that this, this summer uh, new doctors will be coming to uh, Cape Breton. Uh, we'll, we'll have new doctors in Cape Breton this summer. The residency program that the member opposite is re referencing, uh, in fact, is delivering uh, strong results, and doctors in the residency program are also staying to practice in Cape Breton. Order, please. Time allotted for oral questions put by members to ministers has mercifully expired. <laughs> we'll now move on to government business. The Honourable Government House Leader. Mr. Speaker, I move that you do now leave the chair and the House resolve itself into a committee on supply. The Honourable Member for Kings North. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and it is uh, my privilege to begin to uh, speak on uh, supply on the budget that we have just had tabled in the house here and there's some uh... order please the members can exit the chamber quietly if they can the honorable member for kings north has the floor thank you mr speaker there's some pretty serious issues with this budget and i just want to drill down into a, a couple of them i know that uh, most nova scotians just looking from the outside might think this is a uh, good news budget and we have a surplus in the budget. It's very reminiscent of the surplus that 